I think black people should be community, community. organ right right oh. so then how does one do that well you I mean you just have to like start local no like how the community like you say our yeah. local communities yeah how do right. we do that well, I don't, I'm not obligated, obligated to, to, to tell you. Right, right, right. You're, an, you're a community organizer, yes. right? You organize communities. Awesome. Right. What's your neighbor's name? Huh? Yeah, you no, know, like the one that you live next to. Like, oh, what's your neighbor's she's, name? Um, um, she's, okay, she's, uh, awesome. That lady who lives two stores down right? from you? Yeah. So when this revolution comes, what are you going to do about her in her wheelchair? Well, what about it? Like... But what about uh, no, him? you said you're gonna storm the steps. So, but right. there's no ramp. So then you're gonna carry her. Mm-hmm. Well, no, mm-hmm. I'm. Sure, but like if we, far ahead. if okay, they just awesome. unionized, oh, cool. Um, and you said you want like, a, re- a revolution. Okay, awesome. You can't wear right. a mask. Right. Um, um, you want a revolution, but you couldn't wear a mask. You're not even organizing anything now. So now um, what? You're being very aggressive right now as a black, and yeah, I okay. really just think um, all of that is what y'all fucking sound like right now. Please shut up. I just saw a video of a woman talking about how she finds it really interesting that a streaming service like Amazon Prime would have shows that have very anti-capitalist messaging. And her examples were like The Boys and Fallout. And I just think it's an important conversation when it comes to media literacy and like the use of fiction where I have a strong belief that a lot of people in society, like they view fiction as something so distant from themselves and something that's like just otherworldly where people think about like Game of Thrones, uh, House of the Dragon, like just uh, Fallout, like all of these superhero fantasy Lord of the Rings type energy where they can't really see the the thread of connection of like how it relates to our real world like they just go like oh superheroes that's not real like the messaging isn't real and I think in the context of a video I made yesterday talking about how under capitalism and under um this like prison planet theory where like people believe that they have to tell us what's going on in order for you to imprison somebody and I just find it really odd that these products, these shows, this um, anti-capitalism, uh, pro-environmentalism, like with the Avatar I talked about earlier, um, The Handmaid's Tale, just like the, these stories that resonate so deeply because we're all very traumatized by capitalism, imperialism, colonization, the planet dying, so on and so forth. And so they take that fear, they take that discomfort, they repackage it into entertainment, into dopamine hits. And so they can slowly drip it to us and it becomes normalized where it's like, you are using said show to distract, to wind down, to entertain, to whatever it may be. And if I slowly feed you those messages, you will go, okay, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, I love that when the movie has a really good ending. And then, like, you just go back to your daily life and then you just subsidize that good feeling with the entertainment instead of... People like it's like people talking about how like if TikTok gets taken away, it's like where are we all gonna channel that energy? And it's like, yeah, that's a great question to be like, where is all this frustration, this anger, this confusion, this fear going to like synthesize into? And it just I don't know, like it's it's just to make money. Like at the end of the day, it's it's Amazon as a conglomerate, as a business, as an entity, knows how to work capitalism, knows how to protect itself under capitalism. And I think pushing ideas or imagery that's very anti-capitalism in a way protects them. Like it gives, it gives something people to chew on rather than to eat the rich. Toe walking. See, I don't do that. But you walk with your weight in the front of your feet. Yeah, but I'm not like tiptoeing everywhere. It also mentions taking things too literally. Well, I only do it to avoid, to avoid the little crumblies. Don't talk about the crumblies. What about having a fascination with numbers? I don't like math. I don't like it and I'm not good at it. What's your favorite number? 21. Why? Because 7 times 3 is 21. Is that 
supposed to make sense? That's a trick question. Everyone has a favorite number. The only game on your phone is Sudoku. Okay, well, it, it talks a lot about sensory issues, and I, I really don't have crumblies. Besides that, I don't have any sensory issues. Describe how you take a shower. Well, I guess I avoid touching the shower curtain, but who, who wants to touch that? Uh-huh, keep going. And I have to make sure there's not any little hairs in there that I could possibly touch. Mm-hmm. I switched to a stone bath mat because I, I don't like wet feet touching the carpet. Too many fuzzies in there, that's dangerous. Fine, fine, okay? Well, they, they should at least write this better. Just a reminder that we are boycotting Starbucks. I don't give a shit if the NCT backpack is so cute. The photo card herder, it's cute though. The photo card herder, let's hear the herder. No, we're not hearing no fucking order because you're not ordering shit from Starbucks. Stand on business. Don't buy shit. Stand on business. If you don't stand on business, pay on on your ass. Renjun on your ass. We win on your ass. I am on your ass. Don't. I'm Ashley Perez, and I'm a hunky dude. I'm a badass hunky dude, and I am one day on tea. I'm Ash Perez, and I'm a hunky dude. I'm a badass hunky dude, and I am nine months on tea. Happy Pride! Cat. Cuz gay. Please do a full face Arabic glam. <laughs> I'm not even gonna be able to do this any justice. This is so beautiful. I need to do this eye makeup. Oh. This is not my usual content. As many of y'all know, I have been tagged and sent this video all day, all yesterday. And I figured I might just take a second to respond and tell you guys what she means to say. So let's get the obvious one out of the way. Her saying Arabic, was to get clicks. Now that that's out of the way, let's address the photos that she's using as her inspiration. This photo is not of an Arab woman. This is a South Asian style. Everything that she's wearing is South Asian, Pakistani, Indian, Bengali, uh, clothing, accessories, and makeup. Maybe the jhumar, the tikka, something, something would have given it away. And the next picture she uses, there's another big clue here. This is a Mata Patti. Again, another Indian slash Pakistani slash Desi style of jewelry. And if you want another clue, take a look at the Mendi, the henna. The style of it, even though henna is used throughout South Asian and Middle Eastern cultures, this style is particular to, we'll just say the Indian, Pakistani, the South Asian region. Now let's just for a second assume that this creator doesn't know how to say the word Arabic and doesn't understand how to tell the difference between South Asian culture and Middle Eastern cultures. All she had to do was go down into her comments, and there are many people trying to correct her. Not only that, in a time like this, where even if you are thinking of Arab people, you want to talk about their aesthetic, even though again, this is not, you know, this style in this picture is particular South Asians. You want to speak nothing about what's going on to Arab people, specifically what's going on in Rafa. And this creator has many people in the comments telling her to do all eyes on Rafa eye makeup. She sees it. This whole video was compiled for shock value. Just know that these larger creators know what they're doing. They're on the internet just like you are. And they see the same headlines that we do. They're seeing the same photos, the same images coming across their pages all day. As somebody who grew up in America and was originally made fun of in the 90s, I was a 90s kid, 80s baby, you know, made fun of um, for the way that we did our hair or the way that uh, the, the kinds of lunches we would bring, you know, people would think that they were smelly because it was kebab lunches and they would make fun of my, my, my mandi when I would go into school after a wedding. It makes me happy to see so many people are appreciating our culture now and wanting to learn. It makes me happy to see them like integrate uh, jewelry that's Pakistani, Indian, Bengali inspired and, and wearing it with their clothes, you know, when they're going out or maybe they want to wear a sari. I think that's beautiful. What I don't think is beautiful is just kind of like using the aesthetic and not actually caring about the people that you're using as a costume. 
Engaging in anti-colonial movements without deconstructing anti-blackness is inherently incomplete, contradictory, and will eventually show through. Even in non-white spaces, white supremacy and colonial ideologies can still be upheld, which leads to the perpetuation of anti-blackness and makes these spaces very unsafe for black people, which is why you see more and more black people wanting to focus on black issues because when they are in places fighting for other marginalized people, they are still subjected to anti-blackness, all while our issues go unnoticed and uncared for. And when our issues are talked about, people make a concerted effort to take attention away from it and put attention on other issues they see more worthy. Now let me explain why deconstructing anti-blackness should be foundational to anyone engaging in anti-colonial movements. Global racial hierarchies exist that are deeply intertwined with colonial histories. Colonialism established and reinforced a global racial hierarchy with supposedly whiteness at the top and blackness existing as the ultimate antithesis furthest away from the idea and presentation of whiteness. Our modern ideas of race can be traced back to the 18th century scientist Carl Linnaeus who contributed to constructing a global racial hierarchy where all groups that were not European were negatively depicted, surprise, surprise. Note, however, that black people always appeared at the very bottom of this hierarchy associated with negative morals, health, and physical attributes. Even more, Linnaeus made a special direct call out to black women hypersexualizing and fixating on assumed physical differences, which fed into harmful stereotypes and practices that have persisted for centuries. So even as different societies have resisted colonial projects and sought to reclaim their autonomy, many have retained internalized colonial ideologies, including anti-blackness. This means that movements against colonialism can still perpetuate the same racial hierarchies that colonialism established, particularly if they do not explicitly work to dismantle these racial hierarchies. The fact that there is a derogatory word for black people in almost every language is a testament to how deeply anti-blackness has been ingrained in global raciality. This linguistic reality suggests that anti-blackness is a universal language. Anti-colonial movements aim to dismantle systems of oppression imposed by colonialism, right? Yet, if people engaged in these movements do not confront anti-blackness that was central to these colonial ideologies, they risk perpetuating a fundamental aspect of coloniality. Anti-blackness was and is not just a byproduct of colonialism, but a fundamental root. By the way, if you want to learn more, I would recommend all of these books and this article. I've seen this issue arise in conversations happening in my own comment section, and I think many of us are noticing this unfortunately fold on a larger scale. Let's turn this red cabbage into paint. Let me know what you want to see me turn into paint next. This paint is a dye extraction, so to start, you will need to boil the cabbage for a while. I did around 45 minutes on medium heat. Once that's finished, I prepared my compounds alum and washing soda. If you've made it this far into the video, you should join the community discord server and share your ideas for things to turn into paint. I just gotta say it. Wooden cutting boards? They're the best thing. I also uh, bought a milk frother recently, so that's pretty cool. I love a good cappuccino. Now that the pigment is filtered, we are left with the paint that needs to dry. I got these mini uh, jars to save my dry pigment once they're done. I'm saving up a few of them so I can actually make a, a painting with all of them. The texture of this paint is beautiful. I love how smooth the lake pigments are. I would give this paint an easy 5 out of 5, but it's not very archival, and I dislike the smell of cabbage quite a bit, so I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5.
Oh, you're autistic. Okay, a quick question. Who's your favorite neglected child? We've got Matilda. A classic was for sure checking to see if I had powers after this one. Including, but not limited to, the reflection of your own parents and the parent that you wish you had. I could elaborate here, but I don't think it's necessary. Any one of the mysterious Benedict Society kids. Any one of them. Also known as, for autistic children save the world. Uh, what else do you want? Beth Harmon, who I'm counting because so much of the show is her childhood. She literally says she loves chess because the board is the one thing in her life she has control over. A special interest that leads to both her destruction and her self-actualization? Uh, yes, please. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. I did not like her at first until I realized that she was just me if I was vocal about my needs. You're telling me there's a man and I get to stay it to him. I love that this movie shows the various different ways that kids will cope with emotional neglect. Some of them become shy and withdrawn, some of them become a little more aggressive or rebellious. But in a lot of ways, Miranda Cosgrove's character is my favorite, because her way of coping is just trying to keep things routine and controlled and sticking to the rules, but that makes people not like her. Majority of childless adults younger than 50 cite that they just don't want to have kids. 44% of childless individuals 18 to 49 say it's unlikely they will ever have children. 44% almost half. And 56% said they just don't, they just don't want to have kids. If you have people who just don't want to have kids because it's cooler to have puppies that you wheel around in strollers, to go and do all your Instagram pictures of all your cool hiking places, and you don't want to have to share your life with a tiny human you're responsible for, if we're propagating chemical abortion drugs that kill human beings our civilization will collapse and now it's here it's here in america we are below replacement value pro-choice and pro-life americans should agree that we generally need to create and promote the creation of new human beings yeah we don't care one more time for the cheap seats in the back we don't care the people who you should really be talking about now are the people that want to have kids, many of them desperately, but for whatever reason cannot. They haven't found a partner yet and they can't afford or don't want to do it on their own. They um, have fertility issues or just the realities of capitalism prevent them from being parents. Your fear tactics aren't working anymore. Just like the fear tactics trying to convince women to get married and be in a relationship with men, those fear tactics aren't working anymore because we don't want to, and we don't care what happens to the world if we don't. We're tired. Women are tired. Because so many of us have realized that the survival of capitalism depends on our subjugation. And there are a lot of, you know, second waiver, like socialist type feminists who understood this from jump. And I'm talking way back in the day, like Emma Goldman era people, they understood this from the beginning. Women are not interested in rescuing a system that requires our subjugation in order to survive. That kind of system does not deserve to survive. That kind of system should disappear. That kind of system should die. And it's really insulting pro-life lady. I don't know that person's name, but I've seen her face on all the pro-life videos. She's a pretty popular pro-life activist, I think. Um, it's really insulting lady for you to come on the internet and say that people, and by people, you know she's talking about women because she's a pro-life activist, that women, women's reasons for not wanting children are frivolous. But even if you think those reasons are frivolous, do you want a frivolous person becoming a mother? But even the women who give those so-called selfish or frivolous reasons for not wanting children, when you dig down underneath those reasons, you find the truth, the real reason. Having children is not economically sustainable 
for most Americans. And the number of people that it's not economically sustainable for is rising by the day. The cost of childcare is astronomical. It costs as much um, to put a child in daycare, that costs as much as it costs to like send a kid to Harvard or Yale. It's insane. And that's like every year from birth on. But then conservative uh, women like this will say, well, just stay home and you won't need childcare. But yeah, that makes us financially independent on a man. That is not economically sustainable either. That is very risky. So the choices are have a child you can't afford and struggle in, in poverty or permanent lower middle class working poor status, possibly ending up on, on assistance of some kind, or surrender your entire life and your economic well-being and that, that of your children to the whims, desires, and productivity of one person. One person who has been conditioned their entire life that your only value is your service to them. Surrender your life and your well-being and that of your children to a person who does not see you as a human being. I guarantee you that if you dig past the Birkin bag dog selfie, whatever young women on Instagram, beneath those I want my freedom reasons is that. But you don't do that, do you? Because conservative women like you never bother to speak to other women as though they're people. You see women as future mothers, all of them. Because you cannot conceptualize a world where people don't think like you. And you are so afraid of the world transitioning into something new, something you don't recognize, that your only option in your mind is just to go back. If you just go back to the way things were, it, 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 it'll, be, it'll be easier and all the problems will be solved. No, because here's the secret about the way things were. They never were like that. This image we have of family life mid-century in the post-war era, post-World War II era, is a fiction. It is based off of Cold War propaganda. You are asking people to build and organize their lives based on a fantasy a world that never existed. I get that you're scared. A lot of us are scared because the world is changing. Believe me, leftists, we're scared too. We're scared about climate change. We're scared about a lot of things. But what we're not scared of is the world transitioning to something new because we know that that transition could mean something better. But because conservatives live, their, their, their lives are gripped by fear fear of the other, fear of the unknown, that they cannot imagine a world that is better, but is also a world they don't recognize. For them, if they don't recognize it, if they don't understand it, that means it's automatically bad and they want nothing to do with it. Meanwhile, left-leaning people are like, imagine a world where X, Y, Z, this would be so much better. Well, how would we work out this? Well, I don't know. Let's think about it and come up with a plan. Liberals, left-leaning people have the ability to dream in a way that conservatives don't. And it's very sad that they don't have that ability. But I'm telling you, lady, this is only going to get worse. The birth rate is going to keep dropping. It's going to keep dropping. So instead of railing against it, trying to curtail women's rights and force us into economic dependence on men and force us into motherhood, which is basically what motherhood does. It forces you into economic dependence on men or poverty. Like those are the choices for most women. Unless you have like a lot of economic resources, you have a six figure job, you have multiple businesses. The single mothers I know, uh, all, the, all the single mothers I know are doing great, but they're doing great because they're a, they're professional women who had money of their own before they became mothers. And they became mothers very late in life when they were settled and established, they already owned homes. They already had uh, large chosen family communities. They had community support. They already had that before they had a child. Meanwhile, you want women to have kids when they're like 20, 25, before they've figured out who they are, before they've built up their finances, before they've built their community of support that they're going to need to mother in the way that they need to. So instead of trying to do all that, trying to force us, 
You should think about policies that support the world as it is rather than the world as it was or the world as the way you believe it should be. Because this is the world. This is the present. This is the future. It's not going to change. It's not going to go back the way it was. We're not going back. So let's just all accept reality and plan our policies accordingly. I know you're not going to do that. This video really isn't for you. It's for sane people that might be watching this. So you're just going to keep shaming women, blaming women. You're just going to keep, you know, restricting our rights further and further and further and further until we live in this wasteland where nobody in America wants to get pregnant because pregnancy is so dangerous with all these abortion restrictions. There's no hospitals nearby where you can where you can give birth. And even if you can, it's incredibly expensive, and incredibly dangerous because if something goes wrong. Your OBGYN can't treat you the way you need to be treated in order to save your life because of all these restrictions that you supported. So if anyone's unaliving women or unaliving people or unaliving mothers or even unaliving babies, it's not pro-choice people. It's you.